for the state we gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we see Open up the heaven, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our praise. So open up the heaven, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, feeling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. So open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. So open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our I'm gonna 
going to climb a mountain. I'm going to shout about it. I am a child of love. I found a world of freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. Freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. I am a child of love. Nothing can change. change the way you love me nothing can change the way I belong to you yes I do nothing can separate I'm gonna climb a mountain I am a child of love I found some dead bones and get them up and moving this morning. Pentecostal fire 
stirring something new you're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon yeah, resurrection power runs in my veins too and i believe there's another miracle here in this room this is the sound of travels This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm crawling out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Rattle. Come on, Lily. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything that He wants to. Just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah if there's anything that He can't do. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of tribal's rattling. I hear the sound. 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 Bones began to rattle. Rattle. This is what he said. Live, live. Drop bones in the word of the Lord. I said, live, live, live. Drop bones in the word of the Lord. I said, live, live, live. Drop bones in the word of the Lord. I said, live. This is the praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Come on, rattle!
Man, I play that song, I get fired up, bro. <laughs> Woo. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Breaking a sweat for the Lord. <laughs> Let's just thank him. Jesus, 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 Jesus,
Be my praise to you, Jesus. 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 Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. 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 Oh, Jesus. You are King. Cause Jesus, Jesus, you are King. Yes, you are Lord. Jesus, you are King. Jesus, you are king. Yes, Lord, we Who need believes that this morning? Jesus, you are king. Jesus, you are king. Jesus, you are king. Lord above my Lord. Name Jesus, above my name. Jesus, you are king. Jesus, you are king. Jesus, you are king. Yes, you are Lord. Jesus, you are king. 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 King above all names. King above all kings. Jesus, you are king. Jesus, you are king. Jesus, you are king. Who's enjoying Job? Who feels like they're getting some insight from Job? Amen? You feel like you're learning a little bit from Job? It ain't always fun, though, is it? It ain't always feel good. I feel like we're learning something from Job. Today I'm going to talk about a, 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 just a thought about with friends like these, who needs enemies? You know, growing up in Grand Saline, I think Grand Saline was maybe the birthplace of rednecks. Amen. I read this funny thought, and I got a chuckle, so I'm going to share it with you. These are things you never hear a redneck say. Number one, I thought Graceland was tacky. They don't say that. All right, about this? Duct tape will not fix that. Come on, it's okay to smile. Pastor Wayne, this is not preaching. It's smile. Come on, find some joy. How about this? Wrestling's fake. <laughs> I don't care, man. As a 14, 15-year-old boy, you believe wrestling's real. Until you have your heart broke. All right, Barry? Or how about this? That deer head on your wall detracts from your decor. Or we don't believe in firearms. This one really made me laugh. I prefer cappuccino over espresso. But anyway, things you never hear a redneck say. Well, as we think about Job's three friends, we're going to learn some things that probably we should never possibly say to our friends. Amen? Uh, we've already learned a lot about Job. What did we learn about Job? He lost what? Everything. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. He lost his health. But what did he not lose? His faith. Guys, when you have everything in the world coming against you and everything you think worldly is gone, the one thing you can hold on to is your faith. Man, your faith may be shaken, as the scripture, the song we sing about, may be shaken, but when your feet are on the firm foundation, amen, you can, you can stand strong. Well, last week I kind of introduced Job's three friends a little bit, but we didn't really spend a lot of time on them. But Job's three friends were supposed to come and comfort him. How many know that sometimes your friends do not say the right things? Turns out Job's friends really don't comfort them at all. He, he turns it in kind of into torment. And so we're going to talk about some things you never say to your friends. Uh, I grew up in the small town of Grand Saline, right? And so when we were in school, uh, I had a tendency to like to talk. Okay. That's a shocker, isn't it? And every time the teacher would say, who said that? My friends were quick to go, Wayne did it. Throw me under the bus. It's kind of what Job's friends are going to do here. They're going to try to throw Job under the bus and run over him a couple of times, I think. And, and, uh, but have you ever wondered why that's the case, though? Why people are that way, kind of 
naturally they're that way. And it's, the truth is this. People want to get the focus off of themselves and get them on somebody else. Because if you're really looking at somebody else, you won't examine the person that's probably messing up more than that person anyway. So you don't want you, hey, I don't want you to look at me because you might actually see into my life and realize I'm not as spiritual as you think I am. Come on, somebody. Well, if I can get you to look at Shug over here, you'll not notice that I've really got major problems. That's the way people are. No one wants their wrongdoings exposed. No one wants people to really figure out really how they are. They want to put on a facade. So if you've got a facade going on this morning, let's see if we can knock it out from underneath you. And that got everybody nervous. Job chapter 2, verse 11. It says this, When three of Job's friends heard of the tragedy he suffered, they got together and traveled from their homes to comfort and console him. Their names were Elphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuite, and Zephar the Namathite. Say that real quick. And when they saw Job from a distance, they scarcely recognized him. Wailing loudly, they tore their robes, threw dust in the air over their heads to show their grief. And then they sat down on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Now, if we stop right here and don't read anything else, they did a pretty good job. But something happened. They opened their mouths. <laughs> right? So the majority of the rest of Job is going to be about them opening their mouth. And the things that they say. And they basically tell Job, Job, you're suffering because of some choices you make. Or that you're wicked or that what your kids did. And they all follow a similar pattern. Man, the last thing I need sometimes is for somebody to tell me I'm a mess up. I'm already messed up. I'll tell you that myself. Pastor Warren, I'll stand up in front of you and say, man, I'm a mess with a message. I don't need you to tell me I'm a mess. Maybe I can tell you you're a mess. But if you'll look, these speeches follow a pattern. Eliphaz, Eliphaz, Eliphaz speaks first, probably because he may be the oldest. Then Job responds to him. And then Bildad speaks, and then Job responds. And then Zophar speaks, and then Job again responds. And this cycle repeats itself three full times. And Praise the Lord, y'all can be happy. I'm not fixing to examine every word that's spoken over the next 30 or so chapters back and forth between them. But instead, I'm going to talk about their attitudes. The attitudes they take as, their, as Job's friends. And they show us really the wrong way and the right way on how we should deal with friends who are suffering. So there's a wrong way to help a friend who's hurting. Much of what these guys probably say is theologically correct. Listen. But they're making mistakes. A lot of times what y'all say, try to encourage somebody who's going through grief or going through tragedy. Or, man, they're not wrong. But you'd have been better off not saying them. So the first thing I'm going to tell you to do is don't make a false assumption that you haven't figured out on why we're going through what we're going through. False assumptions can get you in big trouble. I heard a funny story about a carpet layer. And you guys who do carpet and building, you're going to think this is pretty funny. He replaced all this carpet for uh, a customer. And as he got the carpet all spread out, he got it all tacked down, and he has just finished. He reached into his top, shirt pocket, and he was going to pull out and get him a cigarette, and he realized his cigarettes were gone. And he looked in the middle of the carpet, and there was a hump in the carpet. And he was like, oops. So he... Figured they were his cigarettes. So he said, man, I don't want to have to pull all this carpet back up. So he got a hammer. Boy, he flattened out that carpet. Bow, 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 bow. Leveled it out. He's like, yes. And he gets his truck and finds his cigarettes. About that time, he hears his owner go, hey, buddy, I left my remote in the den. Have you seen it? Assumptions can be dangerous. False assumptions can lead us to false conclusions. Come on. Which lead us to wrong actions. See, Job's friends assume that only bad people suffer. Who in here thinks that? Anybody here think that only bad people suffer? That's a poor conclusion. You don't have to be living in deep, dark sin to be going through trials and tribulations in your life. So sometimes instead of helping people by assuming something that's wrong, we just add to their misery. 
Elphaz says it like this in Job chapter 5, or chapter 22, he says in verse 5, No, it's because of your wickedness. There's no limit to your sins. For example, you must have lent money to a friend and demanded clothing as security. Yes, you stripped him to the bone. In verse 9 it says, You must have sent widows away empty-handed and crushed the hopes of orphans. That is why you're surrounded by traps and tremble for sudden fears. That is why you cannot see in the darkness and the waves of the waters cover you. Now look, there is no proof or no evidence that Job has ever done anything wrong. Right? Matter of fact, the scripture tells us that God saw him as what? Blameless. As upright. As righteous. Someone who shunned evil. But yet, the friends were saying, well, you're hurting because you've done something you shouldn't be doing. Come on, guys. Hogwash. You don't have to be a bad person to go through bad circumstances. Man, Pastor Wayne, I'm going through the ringer. Man, I'm doing everything right. I come to church. I tithe. I mean, I'm faithful. I trust God. Don't stop. Just because everything's not going the way you should think it should don't mean you give up. Think about it, man. Guys, over the last seven years, man, I've stood in this pulpit time and time again and shared with things that were going on in Wendy and I's life. And, and I've shared with you what, how frustrating and how discouraging and how troubling it was, right? But what did I keep saying? Man, I'm not going to stop going forward. Because the truth is, is when things come against you, you want to stop. But you can't. We're here for a purpose. We've got to keep pushing on. But you know, not all the time when people see us from the outside looking in, we didn't always hear the right things. False assumptions. What are they doing wrong? The second thing you, can, you really should never do, guys, is make faulty assertions about what's God's will. You ever notice that? People want to tell you what God's will is. You know in here who knows God, who know, who know, Who here knows God's will? The Word of God knows His will. And outside the Word of God, unless He has spoke to you directly, you really don't know what someone's going through. I find it interesting, even if there's a national disaster or something terrible going on, you've got people coming on TV saying, oh man, this is God's judgment on America. Man, God's coming, cracking down on America because of what they're, the sin they're in. And while that could be true, because God frowns at sin and sin to test Him, Who are we to speak for God? Why don't we go out and spread the good news and tell them about the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God instead of just standing over people with a a magnifying glass and beating on them saying, this is God's judgment on you. He's punishing you for all your poor choices. Well, most of us, when we make mistakes and we suffer consequences, we know why. We know we chose to do what we did. Pastor Brad says it best. Choose to sin, choose to suffer. You live in sin, you're going to suffer the consequences. But guys, we're on dangerous ground when we start speaking for God, saying this is what God... Don't assume that's what it is. Man, God did this, Pastor, because... Man, don't do that. Woo. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. If the Bible tells us it's God's will, come on, hold on to it, believe it. If God speaks to you directly... This is my will for you. Hold on to it. But it's not your place. And when I say this, this is not being disrespectful at all to play Holy Ghost Junior and try to speak into somebody's life like you're hearing from God when you have not heard anything at all. Bildad thought he had it right and had Job's life figured out. In Job 8, he says this, Does God twist injustice? Does the Almighty twist what is right? Your children must have sinned against him, for, so their punishment is well deserved. But if you pray to God and seek the favor of the Almighty, and if you're pure and live with integrity, he will surely rise up and restore you a happy home. What is Bildad doing? He's claiming to be speaking for God. He told Job the reason his children were die, had died is because they were sinners, and that Job needed to repent for what his children did so that God could restore him. Guys, be careful. When anyone starts trying to tell you what God's will is for your life, you want to know what God's will is for your life? Get in His Word. Get in prayer. And wait on God. Can God send someone to speak into your life healthily? Absolutely. But man, be careful. This happens a lot, guys. 
Many have a poor understanding of what God's will truly is. Their belief system is corrupt. Let me give you some examples of how people's belief system is corrupt. One of the first things I, I want you to understand is if they think that if you're a Christian, you'll never suffer. They believe that. That is contrary to the Word of God. You will suffer if you're a follower of Christ. Here's another one that they think they, that when I say this, you're going to say, but it is. Hold on. Every answer you have is in the Word of God. Not every answer is outlined in the Word of God. However, He is our answer. So don't, don't get twisted here. But listen, if your computer breaks down, do you go to the Word of God or call a computer repair by? Come on, let's leave some logic. Not everything is just broken down. But the truth is, the basic truths of life are in the Word of God. Here's another one that people love to throw out there. If you're having problems, you must be unspiritual. Just not close enough to God. That's why you're going through those problems. That's what Job's friends thought. And guys, that's what a lot of people think when they look at your life and they see you struggling. Well, they must be unspiritual. Or yet, here's another one. It's God's justice in your life because you're messing up. How many here are glad the wages of sin is not paid instantly? The wages of sin is what? Ooh, thank you, Lord, he don't pay those instantly. Because maybe we deserve to have those wages paid instantly. But that's not our God. Our God's full of grace and God's full of mercy and he loves us. And he wants us to have a relationship with us. But unfortunately, there's such a poor understanding of who God is. And how much God truly loves us. What does 1 Timothy 5, 24 say? It says, remember, the sin, not all your sin is always going to come right out. Some of you may live through life and think you've gotten away with it, right? Man, I, I'm sinning and God's not said nothing and I'm getting away with it. I, I'm okay. I want you to realize what Paul tells Timothy. He says, remember, the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins who will not be revealed until later. Guys, come on. We don't need to be that friend. We don't need to be that friend that's trying to help someone else and we say things that are wrong and we really make it worse than what it really is. You know, I, I said there in the midst of what was going on with, with Wendy, I learned so much in the midst of grief that I didn't understand before. I thought I had it figured out, amen? But I realized real quick in the midst of grief, sometimes the best things said are not said. Sometimes the best things are are hugs. Sometimes the best things are are I love you. Sometimes the best things are I'm there for you. Not, man. God works things for the good. I don't want to hear those. Is it true? Yes. Do I want to hear that in the midst of the tragedy, loss? No. Theologically, it sounds, but. Well, there is a right way to help a friend, okay? We read in Job chapter 2, which I read at the very beginning, that Job's friends started out doing what was right. What'd they do? They cried with Job. They put on sackcloth and ashes and sat with him for seven days and didn't say a word. They could have left and gone home, and that would have been perfect. But then they opened their mouths. And at that point, they went from helping him to making it worse. And this should be a lesson to all of us. And I'm going to share five things I think that God has showed me throughout this last process for me and just through the whole process in general. But also, just things God's speaking to me. But these aren't all the things you can do. But these are things that can help in the midst of tragedy or trials or tribulations number one just be there come on be there the best thing you can do is be present when someone is going through something you really don't have to talk i know that's difficult especially for somebody like me that likes to talk i go over sometimes and talk to people and try just to sit man i end up talking lord help me Sometimes the best thing to do is just to be there for your hurting friends and love on them and allow them to share and allow them to talk. Or better yet, just let them sit and y'all sit in the same room together. Man. In the book Postmodern, Postmodern Pilgrims, Lynn Sweet shares a letter of a physician that conveys the power of being just there for somebody in their pain. He write, and this is a little excerpt from that book. It says, Today I visited an eight-year-old girl dying of cancer. 
She was in the worst constant pain you can imagine. As I entered the room, I was overcome immediately by her suffering. My thoughts, so unjust, so unfair, so so unreasonable. Even more overpowering was the presence of her grandmother lying in the bed beside her with her huge body embracing her in the midst of her inhumane suffering. I stood in awe, for I knew I was on holy ground. I was never I would never forget this how great and how gentle this grandmother was to her granddaughter. She never spoke a word while I was there. She laid there holding her, participating in the suffering, as if she could possibly relieve it. And somehow just her silence and her presence seemed to make things better. No words could express what I realized at that moment. Wow. I thought about that point, just that point alone, and I thought about some circumstances over the last few months, and I can tell you the most impactful things that I had happen to me was when people hugged my neck. Oh, man. They didn't have to say a word. Put their arms around me and just hug me. And then the second thing, cry with them. They cried with me. The best things Job's friends did was sit in ashes with him and weep along with Job. The Bible tells us in Romans, be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Guys, tears, if anything, communicate your compassion so much better than your words can ever do. Man, never tell someone who's crying to stop. Instead, empathize with them, sympathize with them, cry with them, and be there for them. When they see your compassion, they will understand that you truly are there for them. The third thing, third thing is more listen more than you talk. The Bible tells us in James, you must all be quick to listen, slow to speak. You know why? That's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. He wants us to listen twice as much as we talk. Anybody know why dog's man's best friend? You talk to your dog, he doesn't talk back. Come on. I read this quote, and this was so true. Someone says when you keep silent, people will suspect you to be a fool. But the truth is you can open your mouth and remove all doubt. Every hurting person needs a friend who will listen to them. Guys, the best thing you can do is let somebody vent. They may say things that sound plum crazy. That's okay. That's why you're listening and that's why you're not responding. Just listen. The fourth thing, guys, that you can do, again, there's a lot more, but I'm just trying to give you a few. Fourth thing you can do is attend to their physical needs. Guys, during Wendy's passing, the last thing I thought about was eating. You know, I I used to always wonder about what's the deal with food when I was a kid. What's the deal with food and funerals and all that kind of stuff. And man, my grandmother was the funeral coordinating queen. I would tell her in a second, man, when funerals, somebody died, she was there with cakes and pies and chicken and dressing and hams. And man, she would just go to town. That was her natural reaction. But the truth is, when you're in the midst of something like that, you're not thinking about eating. You're not thinking about anything. You're just trying to function. So take care of their physical needs. Do, be there for them. You know, people brought us food. Man, we had so much food, we, we actually had to freeze part of it, didn't we, brother? And we were still eating some of it not too long ago. Flawing it out and cooking it again. Guess what? Y'all some good cooks. It's good when it's been thawed and refroze. But the Bible tells us in Proverbs that a true friend sticks closer than a brother. Guys, when you have friends that are suffering... Be there for them. Be sensitive to what they may need physically. Watch over them. (coughs) Excuse me. A person who is grieving and suffering is often burdened so much that they forget to take care of the most simplest things that you think would be something that would be just common sense. They don't eat, they don't sleep, and they don't take care of their personal hygiene. Guys, I'm not trying to be weird, but I didn't think about eating. I couldn't sleep, and I didn't shower for a week. Emily was glad they went home. Why? Because, guys, I wasn't thinking about that. 
I look at this now, and I go back and look at these notes now, and I think about these things now, and I'm going, man, that's exactly what you go through. So be there for them physically. Take care of them. And a good friend will tell you, please take a shower. The fifth thing, and guys, this is the, man, this is the icing on the cake. Pray for them. One thing that's always appropriate in every situation is prayer. Listen, don't preach a sermon. Pray for them. Don't pray a sermon. Listen, if your prayer life is lacking this morning, this is not your opportunity to catch up with the Lord. Come on. I ain't prayed in a few days. Lord Jesus, remember that. No, no, it's not time for that. But take a hold of their hands. Hug onto their neck. Put your arm around their shoulder. Pray for peace. Pray for strength. Love on them. The Bible says the earnest prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective and produces great results. Be there for them so that they will know you're there for them. Let them hear you say, Lord Jesus, touch my friend. Let them hear you say, Lord, love on them. But then move on and be there for them. I can't remember who wrote this article. I want to say it was uh, Dodie Osteen. Maybe it wasn't, but it was a book I read in the midst of uh, Wendy's journey, and it said when I was diagnosed with cancer. And some of the things she wrote down that her friends said to her during her diagnosis and how she felt. And I just want to give you some examples of things probably you shouldn't say. But one of the things the friend said, it says, I can't believe you have cancer. I always thought you were so active and healthy. And she wrote... And she wrote responses to each comment. She said, when I heard this, I felt alienated and somehow different. And she talked, and she's talking with her second friend about her treatments. It says, whatever you do, do not take chemo. It's poison. And she wrote this down. She said, now I'm scared and confused. Friend three said, perhaps God is disciplining you for some sin in your life. She wrote her response was, now I feel guilty. Friend number four said, all things work together for good. She said, now I'm mad at God. Number five friend said, if your faith is great enough, God will heal you. Then she said, well, I must not even have enough faith to have salvation. Her sixth friend came and visited and Oh, wait, number six never came at all. She said, I felt alone and sad. And number seven came and said, I'm here. I care for you. I'm here to help you through this process. Let me pray for you. And she said, I felt loved and victorious. Can we all be like friend number seven? Okay, we're getting close to the end. Praise the Lord. Somebody say amen. The best way to respond to friends who fail you. Guess what? They're going to fail you, guys. Friends are going to fail you. And sometimes Job's friends are going to be exactly like our friends. And they're going to put ourselves in situations that we're going to need to know how to respond. And sometimes we don't know how to respond. Uh, how do you think Job felt? You know, how do you think Job felt with all that was going on in his life? All the situations were going on. Then he's got these three friends that really don't know how to keep their mouth shut. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is don't deny your disappointment. Come on, guys. The easiest response when someone does something wrong or out of line is to forget about it and pretend it never happened. And that's what most of us do. We just kind of wash it away. Man, that didn't happen. I'll just forget about it. It'll go away. But because these were friends of Job's, he wasn't going to just let it go. You know, these were false accusations. He refused to just put a smile on his face and pretend that everything was okay. Because it wasn't. The one thing Job never did do was stomp off in a huff and say, you're not my friends anymore. But instead, he challenged them with his own words. He said this in verse 27 of Job 9. He says, if you decide to forget my complaints, uh, you, put away, you put away my sad face and, and be cheerful, I will still dread all the pain, for I know you will not find me innocent, O oh God. Whatever happens, I will be fine guilty. So what's the use of trying? 
And then it goes on in verse 4, it says, As for you, you smear me with lies. As physicians, you are worthless quacks. If only you could be silent. He tells them, it's better if you'll just hush. It's okay to be honest with friends. If a friend fails you, if they tell you something that's completely crazy and they get you off. <coughs> Goodness gracious. It's okay to say, guys, was that really necessary? Did you really have to go there? I'm not like what you think. Come on. But another thing, be honest, but don't be bitter. Come on, don't be bitter. It's easy to get bitter when a Christian comes against you, a brother in Christ. I don't, get, I don't worry about what the world says about me. Okay, so they think I'm crazy. You ain't seen nothing yet. Come hang out with me a little bit and you'll know I'm crazy. But man, church split all the time because Christians can't even get along. So don't get bitter at one another. Don't, don't, just be honest. Tell them the truth. Don't let the hostility or this, the misconceptions cause you to become bitter and react in anger. Our human nature wants to scream out to somebody when they say something to us and say, Man, that ain't me, that's you. Job refused to become bitter. He refused to receive those accusations. He could have easily said, just wait until you find yourself in my situation, buddy. And I'll show you just how big a rotten sinner you really are. But instead he says, I've heard all this before. What miserable comforters you are. Won't you ever stop blowing hot air? Man, I like Job. What makes you keep talking? I could say the same things if you were in my place. I could spout off criticisms and shake my head at you. But if it were me, I would encourage you. I would try to take away your grief. Instead, I suffer if I defend myself, and I suffer no less if I refuse to speak. Come on. If it was me, I would want to encourage you. Job was basically saying it like this. I'm not going to treat you the way I'd be treated. I'm being treated. I'm going to treat you the way I would like to be treated. Come on, somebody. The third thing this morning, pray for them. And I'm going to talk about this a little more. But the truth is, prayer is the profound turning point in this whole story. Job was suffering greatly, and then God removed his sufferings and restored everything that he had previously based on his prayer. When When did God change Job's situation? When Job prayed, verse 42, chapter 42, verse 10 says this, After Job had prayed before his friends, the Lord had made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. Job could easily have told them, get out of here, you're no longer my friends. But instead, he prayed for them. And the Bible says, after he prayed for them, God prospered him. And there are some people that we come in contact with that fail us time and time again. They fill us in our time of need. They're always there in our bodies, our spirits, our physical flesh. Wants to become bitter with them, but we're not going to become bitter. We're going to pray for them. Think about Jesus on the night he was crucified. He knew that somebody was going to betray him. Come on. He knew that Peter was going to deny him. He knew that all the disciples were going to desert him. Y'all realize that? But what did he do? He prayed for them. Job's wife told, told him to curse God and die. His friends accused him of wickedness. We need to understand that sometimes our friends and our family, the ones closest to us, will fail us. But we cannot take our eyes off of God. Lee Strobel, y'all know who Lee Strobel is. He's got a couple of pretty cool books, but he's got one called God's Outrageous Claims. Tells the story of some parents uh, who got a phone call during the Korean War from their son. And they hadn't heard from him in months, but they were thrilled to hear his voice. And he told them that he was in San Francisco on his way home. And he said, Mom, I just want you to know that I'm bringing a buddy home with me. He's hurt pretty bad. He's only got one eye, one arm, and one leg. And I'm sure, I'm sure he needs to be living with us. Mother said, sure, son. He could stay with us for a while. 
The son replied, said, Mom, you don't understand. I want him to live with us. She said, well, we can try it for a few months. He says, no, Mom. He doesn't have anywhere to go. I want him to live with us permanently. He only has one eye, one arm, and one leg, and he's messed up pretty bad, and he needs us. After talking to her husband, she said, now, son, we can try this for a few months or so. And you being so emotional because you've been in war just ain't fair to us. That boy is going to drag on you and drag us down. And it'll be a constant problem for all of us. So be reasonable. The phone clicked. The next day, the parents got notified by the service that her son had committed suicide. When they received his body and they were viewing his body, through tear-stained eyes, they looked at an unspeak unspeakable horror as they saw a son had lost his eye, had lost his leg, and lost his arm. Remember, be careful to make a judgment before you know what's going on. Family members and friends may fail you, but I want you to know this morning there's one who will never fail you, and his name is Jesus. Let's all stand. Job realized that his wife would disappoint him, realized his friends would fail him, but he refused to curse God and die. He discovered that in, in the midst of what his friends were doing, that he could still stand strong and keep faith. And this morning, I want you to know that in spite of disappointment in your life, as long as you keep your eyes focused on what is eternally important, and that is Jesus, you can go, get through anything. Job learned that his friends would desert him, but God never would. So Job could look ahead, and he could see the promise that God had for him. And today I want you to look ahead, no matter what you have going on in, through your, in your life right now, I want you to be able to look ahead and be like Job did in chapter 19, verse 25, in the scripture that I've read the last three weeks. I'll read it again. Job was able to look ahead and say, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at the end he will stand on the earth. This morning I want you to know that our Redeemer, Jesus, is alive. And no matter what you're going through, He is there for you. So as you look forward through your trial, through your storm, through your battle, Know that Jesus is already there with victory. Hallelujah. Jesus called his disciples friends. Are you a friend of Jesus this morning? You know, I find it interesting. He called his disciples friends even though he knew they were all going to fail him. See, Jesus wants to be your friend. Not just today, but every day. Who here needs a friend this morning? Who needs Jesus this morning? I'm going to...